Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Rostenberg again with Beyond MTHFR. And given the hysteria and the craziness that's happening in the world among us, I wanted to create a video just to highlight some ideas about how stress harms the immune system, okay? Because this is, at this point, and I believe this is going to be the case for this entire uh, experience we're all having, our fear of and stress about this unknown you know, bug that's out there affecting people is far worse than the bug itself. The average age of people that have died from this is still over 80 years old, and we need to have an appropriate response, not an exaggerated response. We kind of have, just like patients with autoimmune diseases, their, their immune system creates an excess of inflammation, they overreact. Uh, we're sort of doing that collectively as a, as a culture. We're overreacting, creating a lot of unnecessary mental inflammation. So I'm going to share with you a few ideas about this. And one of the things I want to point out is simply that most viruses we've had in our life, like the chicken pox, varicella zoster virus, uh, certain herpes viruses, um, Coxsackie viruses, Epstein-Barr, there's quite a few, they get stuck in our DNA. And the reason they don't turn back on is because our body very carefully puts a methyl group on top of that gene. So one of the reasons methylation is so important and why it's a central part of our practice is that methylation controls how genes turn on and off. Very simply, without methylation working correctly, you can't control cancer genes and viral genes that may turn back on at some time. So this just highlights how important methylation is. Now, we often have patients we, that we're working with uh, to help you know, figure out the root cause of their health problem. We have them do uh, genetic testing. This is kind of a, a cut and pasted kind of a collage I put together. Some of the different genes we look for uh, in working with methylation pathways. We're not going to get too much into that in this video, but uh, this is the report we use the most from Sterling Hill. And it just has good data that we can kind of decode as clinicians and figure out where people's weaknesses are uh, and see who, who might really need a lot more methylation support to help support their system. This picture does a good job of explaining this idea a little differently. You can see that a DNA here, a gene here is silenced because it has methyl groups and it has the other histone groups on top of that. But as this cell has to make a copy of this protein, when the DNA replicates, when it makes a copy of itself, it very often has parts of the DNA that no longer have the methylation, uh, the methyl group attached to it. And that's called hemimethylated or unmethylated. Sometimes you see the research call it hypo, hypomethylated. Same thing. There's no methyl group or there should be. Otherwise, if that methyl group doesn't show up, this gene turns on. So your body very carefully and wisely puts methyl groups back in that uh, empty parking spot and then it shuts the gene off. This is essentially how we control which genes turn on and which turn off. That's pretty important. This gene could be a viral gene, it could be a cancer gene, it could be an inflammation gene. We, we don't know, but we don't want it turning on really ever. And when, when there's enough supply of B vitamins and methyl groups in an individual's body, that process uh, goes on without a hitch. But what happens is when we're stressed out, that methylation process um, has an, is decreased. It doesn't work as well. And certainly when we're stressed out, our immune system changes. So you have two negative factors that work against you when you're really wrapped up in this uh, news cycle, when you're you know, reading the blogs and watching TV and Fox News and listening to NPR and CNN and whatever. You know, it's hard to get away from this um, this media that we have. But when you're inundated with that kind of information all the time, your body goes through a stress response. So not only does it lead to possibly reactivating old viruses, as I've shown, due to the methylation cycle malfunctioning as cells turn on uh, and, and replicate, here you have a chart that shows this is uh, levels of cortisol. This is the top 20% of people. This is the highest 20% of people with cortisol in the like, so this is, you know, divided into five groups. This group has 80% more cortisol than all the others. They're at the top. They're the 80 to 100% group. And they have an 80% chance of infection. So basically, the higher your level of cortisol, the higher your risk of infection. 
It's very important to understand. Um, stressing out about the coronavirus and all of this sort of uncharted territory we're going through socially and you know maybe some of the loss of freedoms and the quarantines and all the stuff that that they're suggesting we have to do you know it's kind of stressful well if we let that stress really overwhelm us we're setting ourselves up to, for getting sick whether we're going to catch what's going around or we're going to reactivate something we've already had another way to look at it is simply this represents your white blood cells. This is a different study. And you can see that after a stressor, this is 120 minutes after something very stressful will happen in this study, that the number of neutrophils is increased by 75%. The number of lymphocytes, however, is decreased by 45%. You need lymphocytes to kill viruses. It's just that simple. So if lymphocytes are down 45% and a smaller group of those lymphocytes called natural killer cells, if they're down by 52%, that's a problem for us because the stress that we're getting just from the media itself is creating changes in our immune system that makes us susceptible to infections, viral infections, but also lo losing these natural killer cells or decreasing their number makes us more susceptible to cancer and viruses. So there's really two ways that this stress is getting us. It's shifting our immune system towards cells that help kill bacteria, but we don't really need that right now. We want to focus on supporting our lymphocytes because they are what ultimately kill viruses. So we have that going on. And then we have this chronic stress that leads to reactivation of old viruses. So we have to be careful. We have to uh, you know, find the things that we're thankful for, still go out and have, you know, have fun, try to make yourselves laugh, and just, this is going to pass, all right? Governments overreact all the time, and you have to, you have to keep two opposing ideas that may seem like opposites in your brain at the same time, and one opposing idea is simply that this coronavirus really is super, super deadly, it's the worst thing we've seen in a hundred years, that's possible, I don't really know for sure. Um, then the other side of the coin would be that it's really a huge overreaction and there's not much that's going to come from this that compared to a regular flu season, right? So these are the two ideas that I've kind of seen out there and, the, and I can make an argument for both, one, both of those. What I'm encouraging you to do is not just pick one and run with it, but just try to keep both of those in your brain at the same time. But regardless... If we continue to stress out about this, it's going to set ourselves up for immune compromise. And that's what they're saying on the radio and on the TV is who's really, who's really at risk of this are the people who have a compromised immune system. So this study came out of, you know, almost 30 years ago. And it basically showed that severe chronic stressors one month or longer were associated with a substantial increase in risk of disease. So if we're going to sit here and get on our phones and watch the media for week after week after week pretty soon that's going to significantly increase our risk of getting a virus or reactivating one that we've already had and the way to understand this again is just to think that when we're stressed out it doesn't really matter if you're trying to climb a mountain that's never been climbed or run a marathon or run a, a 5k at your fastest time or whatever you're training for whatever it is um, it could be something physical like that it could just be the stress of the you know not being sure you're going to get enough food and have enough to eat over the next few weeks if the you know grocery stores uh, grocery store shelves become bare and stay that way there's a lot we could stress out about right now but what's happening when you're feeling the stress uh, in in your head your body's acting like your life is threatened and your body goes into the cell and it starts to make new proteins and tries to divide and it tries to grow and make new compounds, new proteins, so that you can have a better chance of surviving whatever the stress is. And when that body goes in to the cell and it starts to read the DNA, that's when you have a chance to turn on old viruses, okay? That's when you have a chance to activate genes that you don't want to turn on. And I'm, you know, I'm just sharing this with you because People in my family are worried, and maybe I've, I've been a little concerned about what's going on, just like everybody else. But I have to remind myself about what the science shows us, and what we know to be true is that stress is a, is a major factor in reactivating viruses, and I don't want to do that. 
I don't want to reactivate something my body's already taken care of years ago because I was unable to unplug myself from the, you know, from the media and whatever. So the, the science simply agrees with this. Virus reactivation is commonly observed in cells that are actively dividing. That's, that's what's happening, guys. When you stress yourself out, your cells divide, they make new proteins, and that increases the risk of the methylation groups, the methyl groups not being put back on the gene the right way, and then it can accidentally read a gene for virus. And then, boom, you have a new infection that you, you know, haven't had for 20 years. So we have to manage our stress. And just looking a couple more slides here at how exercise changes our immune system because exercise is one form of stress. Basically, people who don't exercise at all have about an average risk of having an upper respiratory infection, an average risk. And then people who moderately exercise, you know, they're not overdoing it. They're not living their whole life around training. They're, they're finding that balance between work, life, and exercise. They actually have a below average risk because that's kind of a de-stressor for your body. Moving a little bit's better than not moving at all. But if you start to move too much and you train too much, it is a stressor. And you can see that they have a much higher risk of upper respiratory infections. And what is the coronavirus? It is simply an upper respiratory infection. So if you're listening to this video and you're a little bit bummed that your gym is closed and your exercise class is closed, take it um, as a gift. You know, maybe you were overtraining and trying to get ready for this marathon this spring and you're really pushing yourself. Maybe you just need to back off and just move and have fun like kids do and do a little exercise, get your heart rate up, but don't do anything serious. Because what that's going to do is lower your risk of getting sick, especially for upper respiratory infections. Here you can see the difference between people who run marathons and people who are just chilling out, resting controls. The marathoner's body is so sensitive to stress because marathon running is so stressful. And I'm picking on marathon runners, but other athletes would qualify. But you can see that marathon runners here, their cortisol spikes way, way, way high right after their exercise. And it takes hours for it to come back down. Whereas somebody who just doesn't, isn't training for a marathon, you know, they, they actually get like a relaxation response from, from exercising. Isn't that what's, what it's supposed to be, All right? Same thing with adrenaline. Uh, people who happen to be marathon runners here, when they, during their exercise and after, they have just a massive amount of uh, stress chemicals floating through their bloodstream. It's very oxidizing, it's inflammatory, and it changes our immune system. So the moral of the story with all of this, here's another data point basically saying the same thing. After exercise, here on the right side, you have a decrease in immune cells. And, you know, that's not something that would be conducive. This is specifically looking at lymphocytes, okay? This is your entire immune system on the, on the left. Yes, you have a boost in immune cells, but you have a decrease in the number of cells that actually kill viruses, which is what we want after all. So I, I hope to give you more updates as, as things are happening. We're trying to get some information. There seems to be an interesting connection between legume consumption and deaths from coronavirus. I don't have this, this study in front of me to show you right now, but um, there's some interesting connections between what's going on in our gut and what our diet is like and whether or not we have susceptibility to certain viruses. So out of all this stress and chaos, I hope you know we do get some good information out there on what we could use going forward to help people improve their health and well-being. So you know, if you have any other questions or you'd like a little more work, uh, help on this, what I would recommend you do is simply uh, go check out my my website, Beyond MTHFR. Uh, we've got a lot of articles up there, of course, about these issues. I did a, an art, uh, made an, art, an article a couple years ago in 2017 called MTHFR and Viral Infections right here that's still pretty pertinent today. And you know, for lowering stress, I have some information on protocols up here for adrenal fatigue. If you go to protocols and check out adrenal fatigue, that'd be where you get some ideas on how to lower stress. And again, I'd say if any of you out there are looking for a doctor you want to work with to help you figure out some susceptibilities you have, figure out the holes in your bucket, um, work you through our process, 
You know, that's what myself and my other colleagues in our office do. So reach out. You can contact us at our Red Mountain Clinic website. That's one, one other way to become a patient if you're interested. So we work with people in over 20 different countries uh, all over the United States, North America. Um, there's really no, as long as we speak English, we can pretty much help you. And even some of our patients, we don't even, uh, we have an interpreter for. So that's it, guys. I hope you have a great and productive rest of your day. And we're going to get through this. So stay tuned, and I hope you enjoy this video on stress and how it harms the immune system. Thank you. Bye-bye.